The following is our extended conversation with Mike Cackley around social and emotional learning. Welcome, I'm Dave. I'm John. And this is Teaching Like Ted Lasso. Mike Cackley is a middle school math teacher and an educational coach specializing in project-based learning and social emotional learning. Welcome to the podcast. I will let Mike introduce himself. He's here to talk with us about social emotional learning. Thanks, John. It's great to be with you guys. My name is Mike Cackley and I am an educator of 20 years. I've taught basically STEM, middle school STEM back before it was called that in the day. And I have taught math, history, personal finance, lots of different things. And really my area of passion is project-based learning. And what I've come to realize over the past few years is that social emotional learning is kind of the final product of PBL. That's kind of where I've landed that the reason why we do PBL is to develop the SEL skills in kids. So what is project-based learning to you? Project-based learning is an approach where students are learning through a project. It's not something just thrown on at the end. Kids are involved in deep inquiry and they're working with the community to solve a problem. Oftentimes they are working collaboratively. The The learning happens through the project rather than as some kind of add-on at the end. So how do you see that as, because I mean, that sounds very academic. I mean, there is the community aspect to it. So how do you see that as leading to uh, social emotional learning? After COVID, there was a push for social emotional learning. And in my opinion, it's a reaction against the over push towards standards that we had with Common Core, where that was the only thing that mattered. And obviously with COVID, we kind of re-evaluated some things. So with that, there's a lot of misconceptions, I would argue, about SEL. And a lot of people think of it in very narrow terms, like, oh, it's breathing, yoga, mindfulness exercises. And, and I would say that that is one small piece of SEL, and th those actually are more tools to develop some of the competencies and the companies see themselves. And so a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what it really is. And they just think, hey, you know, and especially in the math world, the SEL is a waste of academic time. It's just fluff. Kumbaya, around the campfire, throw a stick on. I don't have time for that. I'm, I'm here to teach math. That's just not true. I use the castle framework because it's internationally recognized. And even the acronym for CASEL, the A in CASEL stands for academic. Mm -hmm. So it's a collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning. And it's a very Western way of thinking to divide everything up and co compartmentalize everything. In reality, all these things are intertwined together and can't be separated. That definitely helps me make sense of the connection you see to the project-based learning, because project-based learning has a lot of that intertwining of uh, your goals for the students as well. For sure. And what we know about SEL from research is it, for it to work, you need a couple of things. Number one, you need adults to model it. Number two, it has to be integrated into the daily activities of the classroom. And unfortunately, what most schools do is just buy some canned curriculum. And if it's elementary school, we do it in morning meeting. If it's secondary, we do it in advisory. And it's a check mark that we click off and say, yeah, we do SEL here, rather than really diving in and making it a core part of what we do in the classroom. Is there a project that you've done that you feel like is a good example of this? So this is just a small thing. I start the year off with what I just a mini project that I call the selfie project. It's really just to get to know your activity with the students. And I do some slides and I give them a template and kids do some slides. It was just really interesting. I'm teaching sixth grade math to see how well the students responded to it because it allowed them to personalize and share things they're interested in. And I don't think they have that experience a lot in math class. You know, that's, that's yeah. safe for ELA class. I had a lot of positive, even at conferences, I had parents positive feedback about that. And it was just a couple of days that I spent at the beginning of the year building some classroom culture, but it really seemed to impact my students and their attitude towards the class. And I would have kids who say, you know, I hate math, but I like this class. And to me, that's that's the first win right there. 
Yeah, I like that. So I'll start class sometimes. Uh, I mean, I do a sign-in sheet and sometimes it's I ask them questions that I need to know, like how far are you on your project? Or do you have questions about some something we're working on? But usually it's goofy questions. And one of my classes this semester, they've like taken that and run with it. So when I come into the classroom, they have five poll questions up on the backboard. And we spend the first couple of minutes every day talking about kind of what what they're interested in. And it could be something like, uh, do you put your ketchup on your fries or on the side? <laughs> or it could be a serious issue, you know, like, do you support vouchers for education? Right. I never know what's going to be up on the up on the board. I um, love how the students are are owning it because that just makes it so much more powerful. I use uh, on a scale of I don't know if you've ever seen those. Mm-hmm. If you Google on a scale of and they're just silly pictures of, you know, on a scale of sheep and there are these nine weird pictures of sheep. And I introduce that at the beginning of the year and every week I do a different one. And the kids check in with each other on the scale of sheep. Well, it doesn't take very long, just like you're saying, before the kids start making them. Now, all the ones I do are made by the students, and I just keep a backlog of them as they send them in to me. And half the stuff, I don't even know what it is. It's anime or video <laughs> games or whatever, but they love it. And they get the chance to explain that to you. It makes them the expert. We're kind of a rural area, so a lot of them will do you know, farm animals that they have at home. Thinking about what you said about people have the misconception that it's this waste of time. And we've just spent a couple minutes talking about things that are very like non-math, for example, if we're talking about a math class. So how do you counter that idea that, that this is a waste of time? There's a couple of things. For one, I'm just not a big fan of the idea that we have to teach bell to bell and that kids can't ever take a mental break. That's developmentally untrue for a sixth grader anyway. And just the five minute passing time isn't enough either. So I think it's okay at the beginning of class or in the middle of something to do something a little silly and fun once in a while. If we actually look at them, and I'm sure you can put links in this so people can look at it. The five castle competencies, there's a couple of them that I think really stand out in the math classroom. And the one that stands out the most is responsible decision making. And just to give you an idea of my approach versus some people's approach, especially in lower early elementary A lot of schools and teachers treat this as like, you need to make good decisions and be good. Like, Johnny, don't pull pull Susie's hair. That's a bad choice. And it's all about behavior. I look at it much more broadly into, we are developing citizens. And I want kids to grow up to make responsible decisions about the world. And not only that, they can do it right now. Like, we don't have to wait till they grow up. We have plenty of examples of young people you know, leading the environmental crusade, for example, or Parkland students for gun control. So they don't need to wait for someday. But if I'm just pulled it up here, responsible decision making, these are some of the sub bullet points. Demonstrating curiosity and open mindedness. I want my kids to be curious in math and open minded and look for lots of solutions. Learning how to make a recent judgment after analyzing information, data and facts. I mean, that sounds like a math standard right there to me. And that's such a difficult thing, like getting yeah. to reflect on what did they do and how to evaluate it, kind of process it a bit. Challenging critical that. thinking skills useful both inside and outside the classroom. But when we talk about responsible decision making, it's really problem solving, analyzing uh, all the verbs that we want to use in the math room. And so I just think that that particular branch of SEL is 100 percent compatible with everything in the math classroom of problem solving and getting kids to think which is a big focus right now of thinking versus mimicking too so getting kids to think deeply about math content and then hopefully those are transferable skills that they're going to use in other places and the other thing about math i always say that we got we do everything backwards in this country everything is focused on ela and math because that's the common core and it's this national tested one Well, the interesting part of school is in social studies and science, because math and English are agnostic. They're not tied to anything. I can find math in any project. I mean, I can find literacy in ELA in any project. And so literally, you can do a math project about anything. The, The topics come from social studies and science, where math and English are the skills for how to do it. When we talk about equity with future teachers, Letting them use math as a lens to 
analyze the world that they care about. That's a huge part of humanizing mathematics. So you've actually written the book on this, right? Connecting inquiry and social emotional. Yes. Learning. Yeah, I've recently co-authored a book with Dr. Martinga Regatz, uh, Pulse of PBL, and it's Cultivating Equity Through Social Emotional Learning. And as I kind of said at the beginning, we see the SEL skills as the final product of a project. Oftentimes, we talk about ideal graduates or portrait of a graduate, and we list all these skills that we want kids to have when they leave the classroom. Mm -hmm. And those are SEL skills. I hate the term soft skills because they're, they're not soft at all. And really, those skills that we want to develop are SEL. And if you look at the council competencies, they all kind of fit in there. If that's what we really want our kids to develop and be, and then math to me is just a tool to get there. That's how how I look at it. And I'll I'll mention a couple other things from the competencies. So another big area is, is self-management, getting kids to be able to manage themselves. they you know, I say the three T's, their team task and time. When you think about it, one of the big things we're always pushing in math class is for perseverance. And perseverance is a self-management skill. I, I was working with some kids this past week on ratio tables, and they're really good at the additive ratio table, but then we throw these ones at them where it's multiplicative and skipping around. And they some of the kids uh, conceptually were really struggling with it. And I had a girl in tears, and I just told her, you know, hey, you got this, keep working on it. And we kept working on it, and by the end of the hour, she got it. And that's where the, that perseverance comes in because if you don't have that in math, you're you're not going to make it. You you can't just give up because everyone struggles sometimes. And so then that leads to the identity piece, which again, often associated with ELA, like, oh, who am I kind of stuff. But I think we know that kids' math identity is huge and how kids see themselves. So that self-awareness of, yeah, actually, I can't do math. And that's, to me, like the first battle, once again, because... If kids think they can't do math, then it's self-fulfilling prophecy. What are, I don't I hope I'm not being too repetitive here, but like, what are some things that happen in your classroom where, where kind of a math identity gets built? I mean, you talked about an individual interaction with your student with the ratio table. Is it just kind of a compilation of those kinds of experiences over the year, or is it something you address intentionally? I, I think it's both. You know, I'm I'm definitely addressing it in my language and how kids talk and especially how kids self-talk like i'm going to correct a kid who has negative self-talk because that's really harmful but you know they're just kids they don't know any different but you got to build that confidence in them i i had this this girl this year and we do a lot of the thinking classroom routines random groups at the boards open-ended problems and this girl was really one of my best thinkers and just encouraging her and really enjoying watching her do her work. Now, she's the kind of kid that makes some errors, computational errors along the way. So sometimes she she doesn't always get everything right, but her thinking, her thinking is beautiful. She wrote me a full page letter that I have right on my desk. I look at it all the time saying, you made me believe that I can do math. I never thought I could before this year. And it made me happy. And it also made me really sad. How are you in sixth grade? And you made it this far thinking that you're not good at math. When I think about her compared to many other students, she's certainly not near the bottom. Yeah, I have a, a pre-service teacher this semester who, I like you were saying about correcting math talk, she'll say, you know, I'm not a math person or I can't do this. And uh, I'll say, yet? <laughs> you mean yet? Yep. Uh, but then I'll also directly argue with her because she asks the most amazing questions. A lot of our classroom discourse is driven by her willingness to say, just wait a second. <laughs> you know, what is really happening? And a lot of it is celebrating that. I, when I have students at the board and they're still, I, I can't say I'm implementing the thinking classroom all with fidelity. I'm still learning how to do it myself. But oftentimes kids are still looking to me. They'll ask me a question like, well, how long was it? And I'm like, yeah, just acknowledging that and making a big deal out of it. I'll be like, yes, great question. And then I just walk away. Like you're asking the right question, but I'm not going to answer it for you. Yeah. But you're you're thinking about what you need to know and just encourage them like, hey, great question. And then walk away and let them figure out what to do with the question. 
And yeah. I don't, I'm not as good at that, but that's, that's yeah. my goal to really push kids and acknowledge and celebrate when they do something different, when they have a different approach, when they ask good questions. And that always makes me think of the ELA thing about how questions are what move us forward. So getting the learner to pose that question, that really is what they need. Do you want to say something about the Desmos mathematician list? Sure. I also think, you know, you brought up a few minutes ago about equity and just finding little ways to celebrate that math doesn't always come from white males, you know, and I love the Desmos randomizer of famous mathematicians. And I mean, to be honest, I don't know who most of them are, but it's obvious, not only to me, but to the kids that these people are from all over the world in different cultures, just by the kinds of names they have. And I think it's important to celebrate that diversity and honor the equity. One of the things I lean into, uh, I have a, a decent amount of Hispanic students in my school. Some of them are really good mathematicians and I'm pushing them like, hey, have you ever thought about engineering? Have you thought about this? You know, just acknowledging, getting them to see, because a lot of times they just don't have confidence in themselves because that's not necessarily what's in their family, just how they're how their situation is, they so, may yeah. not have anyone in their immediate family who's gone to college. And that may not be something they've even considered. Yeah. So they don't even see it as a possibility. Yeah. And to me, equity isn't like some special stuff that you sprinkle on to what you're doing. That that to me can be like othering kids and saying, oh, I'm going to do this for these kids because they're black and brown. Well, that's problematic to me. To me, equity is like, you have amazing skills and I'm going to push you to the highest level because I know math is a gateway to college and opportunities. And if you can't do math, you're pro- it's unlikely that if you struggle with math that you're going to graduate from college and maybe not even attend. And so to me, I see it as like a gatekeeper that I'm helping these kids have the option. Like they might not choose to do it, but I don't want them to be held back because of a lack of being pushed in an area that they can do. Yeah, they if they're intimidated, then they don't even try it. And then uh, that keeps them from that next level. It's just so encouraging. Like I, I have a class of math seniors in a capstone. And we used, we used that Desmos list for them to research some mathematicians that they hadn't heard of. And, and they wanted to know, you know, why can they get to the point of graduating with a college math degree and not have even heard of some of these people? So, you know, the thought of middle school students, you know, finding out and looking into it a little bit and even just noticing the diversity of the names, maybe. Yeah, it's important. We need to see models. So sometimes we'll ask when we're talking about a particular topic about barriers to teachers kind of engaging in in an idea or bringing it into their classroom. And you've talked a little bit about kind of misconceptions of SEL. That's got it. That's got to be part of the barrier. Do are there other things that you think make it hard for teachers to adjust this in the classroom? There's a couple of things. What most teachers are going to think of immediately is time. When do I have time to do this? Mm. That's the first barrier. And then the second thing is they may not have the skill set to really be an expert in SEL. They need to do some self-work first. Yeah, that's really interesting. So how do they get started? Like anything. I mean, I'm, you know, how do I know you? Through Twitter, you know, going out and learning, like go out. Everything's out there. Do some reading. Do some studying, find a book club, learn about it is, is the first step. And then the, the key part of this is it's not like I do five minutes of SEL every day. I do it all day, every day, and it's just ingrained in what we're doing and just being aware of it and looking for opportunities to reinforce that great problem solving or to counteract that negative mindset and just embedding it in to what we do to push each kid in different ways where they need it. It's, it's personalized. You, you can, if you have a class that's struggling with a specific skill set, you can do a little mini lesson, spend five minutes on it and, and talk about that topic and say, hey, guys, I want us to focus on this today. Like, we're not sharing in, in our groups. I want us to work on collaborating better in our groups. And then it can be as simple as at the end of class, say, hey, fist to five, how did you do today? Or turn and talk. Talk to your group members for one minute. And so it doesn't have to be this huge time thing, but consistently just throwing it out there and talking about it all the time for a minute or two. I really like that way of thinking about it. Like even just becoming familiar with these competencies, like you were talking about from the castle framework, because probably they're already engaged in some of some of those things. And 
It's just going to help a teacher see when they're doing in that or identify an opportunity, you know, to emphasize those things. I really like that a lot. Is there anything else that you'd like people to know either about our topic today or about your work? I just say that I'm very passionate about PBL and SEL. And so I do consulting on the side and have my book. I'd love for you to check it out if you're interested. And I'm always available to chat with people online or whatever about it because I'm passionate about it. So it had, didn't come up beforehand. Are you familiar with the show, Ted Lasso? I, obviously, I've heard of it. I don't live in a bubble, but I've never actually seen it because <laughs> I don't have Apple TV. I've seen a clip on YouTube or so, the one where he's in the throwing darts. That's the big one. That was a pretty good clip. If it becomes accessible at some point, uh, it's just, it's. I enjoy it as a show that where the people are working on becoming better people, which kind of sometimes then makes you realize how much of media is not about that. We also ask a silly question that there a chance to really learn something about people. The one we're asking this episode is, what's the farthest you've traveled from home? So where was that? I lived in China, Shenyang, China for two years. Wow. That's my uh, distance, I would ha- definitely have to say. Was it a part of a learning experience or were you teaching? I was teaching English over there. And that's actually what moved me to get into education. I really wasn't a teacher before that. I came back and went to the GTC program at Grand Valley after that and became a teacher, largely based on that experience. Oh, I didn't know that. That's fabulous. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Mike, and sharing this expertise. And I enjoyed catching up with you just because it had been way too long since I, I've yeah. seen the local meeting or something. And uh, knowing you're that close, hopefully I can get some students in your classroom or something at some point. That would that, that would always be great. Well, thanks, John. It was great chatting with you.